We get to play the games that we play for so many reasons. The way we stumble upon games and end up playing them. And Taluva is a game that I did play for unusual reasons. Recently I played Santorini, pretty much an abstract game but with gorgeous components. And at the end of each game of Santorini, I noticed something that it wasn't just that the components were like beautiful, gorgeous individually. There was something about the way the board looked at the end. Um, the components came together to create a beautiful, a beautiful composition. At the end of Santorini, you have a little town that you have created. And again, it wasn't just the the sum of the parts, the sum of the components that came together. There was a certain system of proportions, there was a certain harmony, which comes from the fact, of course, that you did not build the town just randomly, but you were following rules and it just so happened that the components ended up placed in a certain way. Again, with a certain harmony, with a certain structure, with a certain overall vision due to the constraints of the design. And I realized, wow, that is something pretty interesting because you think in literature, the idea that constraints can actually result in, in beautiful, creative works of art, uh, that's an old idea. If you think about the sonnet, the sonnet is a very, it's a highly codified poetic form, and yet kind of like by entering that form, in a certain sense you're constrained, but in another sense um, there is a time-tested system of structuring words that will um, help you, if you're a good poet of course, uh, get to create something beautiful. Or the French, uh, the French writers of the Ulipo group, that also give themselves strict rules and create art by abiding to those rules. So I thought, wow, this is basically, maybe there is such a thing in, in board gaming too. There is a type of aesthetics, a type of pleasure that I haven't even known before. Um, that is games that create something beautiful that at then games that you look at the board at the end and there is something beautiful that was created during gameplay, both because of the beauty of the components individually, but also because of the way that the rules have organized and structured the overall construction of, of the final configuration of the board. Long story short, well, long story long, because it has taken me quite a bit to tell you up to this point, um, I went on Burgin Geek and I started a geek list called Games That Create Something Beautiful and I hope that you have a look at it and you add more suggestions and games that you feel fit that category and then looking at what other people have contributed to the list, that's when I learned about Taluva that was recommended as a game that in fact creates something beautiful, that at the end you look at the board and the board almost looks like a work of art. The components are beautiful individually and they come together in an amazing way. They create compositions. Sometimes you will almost, if you have this game, you almost feel playing it just because you want to see uh, what, what, it, what it creates, how beautiful the board looks like at the end. And this is a, is a, um, is a board that is created by connecting tiles, so actually the board will look in vastly different ways um, game after game. Taluva uh, is a game where you build an island and you build civilization, you build different civilizations, you create settlements. It is not clear in the game like who you are if you're playing a specific role. The game is pretty abstract, but uh, given some of the mechanics, I got the sense that pretty much you're a god, you're the players are different gods that are that are affecting the landscape, influencing the way different populations are developing, and they like to be worshipped. In fact, among the things you will build temples, and temples is what really matters. Um, building temples is what allows you to score at the end. So as a god, you get you're pleased if your population is is building temples for you. Sometimes you punish them, you destroy some of their huts. Uh, but I'm getting way uh, ahead. Let, before I tell you more in general, let me show you the component, let me show you how the game works so that my references to temples and huts and things like that will make sense. And then we'll talk about the game in general at the end in the conclusions of this video. Each player has a pool of wooden pieces. There are three types of pieces, towers, temples, and huts, a lot of huts, mainly huts, and yeah, they look like camping tents, but trust me, they are huts, at least in game terms. 
Then you have terrain tiles, so the tiles that I used to form the board. Uh, these tiles are thick, they're darn thick. They have to be some of the thickest terrain tiles I've ever seen, if not the thickest. This is great component-wise. The tiles are sturdy, they're fun to manipulate, they look good as you stack them, but it's also important in game terms because terrain is divided in levels. An area on the board that only has one tile is level one, and then of course there may be level two, level three, and so on. Even though level three is really the only one. It's the highest that matters in game play terms. Your turn is super simple. What you do, you draw a tile from the pool, and look at the tiles have this really nice art showing different types of terrain, a lot of volcanoes. So in your turn you draw a tile and you add it to the table. Uh, the first player simply flips one and places on the table. Later, new terrain tiles that are added need to touch previous terrain tiles with a list, an edge. What you do is each turn you draw a terrain tile and you add it to the board. And then you must, must, must build. You must take one of your pieces and put it on the board. First, let's talk about placement of tiles. You can always get a new tile and place it on the table that is a level one, expanding the island uh, around, again, at the, at the ground level. You may also add tiles on top of other tiles, building up multiple levels. Several rules need to be followed in this case. You need to place a volcano area on top of another volcano area to expand it. Also, you must not place it exactly on top of another tile. So in this case, that would be an illegal placement. I separate them just to show you that I am covering a tile exactly with another tile. Yes, there is a volcano requirement, but that is still illegal. But this would be a legal placement. Volcano on top of volcano, I'm not covering a tile exactly. That is good. During the game, there will also be game pieces on the board, of course, because you're building stuff. And when you place tiles, you can place on top of huts, the huts of the opponent of your own, and those are destroyed, return not to the player, but they go to the game box, they're out of the game. And sometimes you'll destroy huts of the opponent, and sometimes you will destroy your own huts. There may be advantages in doing that. You cannot, uh, with a new terrain tile, cover temples or towers, so these secure your, your area, make it harder for the opponent to destroy your own properties. Also, of course, as you play styles, they cannot hang out uh, on the board, uh, they cannot go where there isn't anything underneath, uh, so you can also not place them on multiple levels because that will look weird. So you place your new terrain tile, either a new terrain tile on the board, or again expanding areas that are there already. And I'm, I'm building a situation, trying also to keep it uh, legal to show you a level 3, because that would be important. We'll see in a second. Almost there. Almost there. <laughs> there you go. Here we got finally a level three, which maybe from there you don't see perfectly, but you get a sense. One, two, three. Why, why is that important? You'll see in a sec. As we said, you place your terrain tile and then you build. Now, when you build, you can build huts, and those need to be built at level 1. Or you may choose to declare an expand action, to expand your settlement. Oh, actually, we should talk about settlements. A settlement is a group of hexes that has your properties and that are connected to one another. In this case, that is a settlement. If later, because of game effects, I were to lose that token, I would lose that hat, now this, this settlement here was turned into two separate settlements. Um, and remember, since you can only have a temple or a tower and or a tower in a settlement, but not two of each kind, two towers or two temples, and sometimes you want to break down settlements so that then you can rebuild them, expand them somewhere else to get more towers and temples. 
So uh, for an action, or better, during for your build action, you can add a hut to the board at level one. You can never build on top of volcanoes. You can also choose the expand action, in which case you select a type of terrain, say now I want to select forest, and you place new hats in each type of terrain of that kind that is adjacent to your settlement. And you place a hat for each hex of that terrain at level 1, two hats at level 2, and so on and so forth. So the expand action allows you to place huts at levels that are higher than one, which is not usually allowed, but also consume your resources much faster. If you run out of buildings, if you should build, but you can't, then you're out of the game. This is one of the rare games of this kind, abstract um, slash Euro gamey with direct play elimination, but that is the rule. So I can hand new hats at level one. I can use the expand action. I can place temples adjacent to any settlement that already has at least three uh, hexes that covers at least three hexes. So that is good. I can also place towers ad ad adjacent to one of my settlements, but towers have to be a level three or higher. To show an example of why and how it can be advantageous from time to time to destroy your own things, suppose that I get this style here. See here we have a single settlement, I cannot add any more temples, but I could place a tile here, which is entirely legal, destroy my own huts. Then this is a separate settlement that, oh poor settlement doesn't have temples in it, what are people going to do on Sunday, they're going to get bored. So then later I add more terrain and now I have a settlement of three uh, to which later I may add a temple. This way I did not have to build a new settlement from start. I could exploit some of the huts that I had placed there earlier. The game continues until all tiles are gone and at that point the player with the most temples on the board is the winner of the game. If there is a tile then it goes to most towers. If there is a tile there too it goes to most huts on the board. The game may also end early if, say, you're the last player in the game because everybody else was kicked out of the game because they wasted all of their buildings. You also uh, win the game early if you placed all of your specimens of two kinds of buildings on the board. So, for example, you place all of your temples and all of your towers, all of the temples and all of the huts, or all the huts and all of the towers. Any two kinds of the three buildings that you have, you don't have any left in your pool, then the game is over immediately and you win the game. So Taluva, uh, not a very famous game, came out a couple of years ago, I hadn't really heard of it, maybe once or twice, um, but I can't say it was a classic, I think it's a little bit of an overlooked game, and I think it's a pity because not only does it look excellent, not only is aesthetically very pleasing, uh, looking at the board at the end, I have to tell you, this has to be one of the most gorgeous games that I own, and I own a bunch. Uh, it is just a beauty, really, sometimes I feel like leave it set up at the end of the session as, as a decoration, as a, as a work of art on my table. It's so beautiful and really uh, the beauty of it also comes from the general organizing principle that the, that the rules form within the game. You're playing to win and you also end up creating a beautiful, beautiful board at the end. But game-wise, this is also very interesting. It's an abstract in essence, but it's one that is absolutely fun and with a lot of subtleties. Um, you will, after a couple of turns, figure out a couple of things. Um, maybe I'll give you some spoilers here, talking about the strategy and part of the pleasures also in finding it, but you'll, you'll find out more things, uh, even if I spoil one or two to you. Of course, at the beginning, you may have the temptation of simply, bam, dumping uh, tiles on the head of your opponents, constantly destroying their huts, preventing them from getting settlements that will allow them to build temples, and that's one way of doing it. Um, but sooner or later, the opponent will figure out ways of placing the tiles uh, to prevent you to do so uh, by having configurations that uh, um, will not allow you to dump a tile on because maybe there is a part of the board that bulges out and you, if you were to place a tile, you would have to put it right on top, which is forbidden. Maybe the opponent has placed tiles with the volcano sites um, on the 
on the outside of the configuration so that in the middle there is an area of hexes that only have say you know forest or mountains in any case there are three four hexes that simply do not have any volcanoes there and you cannot place a hex on top a piece on top of another unless you are connecting vertically to volcanoes um, different uh, again building on the edges uh, helps with that uh, different levels uh, also help you with that because the opponent cannot place them uh, cannot place pieces that are sticking out from an edge you will find all of these ways of protecting your huts and after you did that after you created an impervious area that the opponents will never to be, to be able to build on you regret it Oh, you find out that the thing backfires because after you built the settlement and you so you expanded enough to add a temple, the best way of doing it is to destroy part of it, to, to cut it, to sever part of the settlement so they can use those huts as the initial part of another settlement. So actually, there is this very fine balance that you're trying to achieve in creating settlements that are stable enough that the opponent doesn't doesn't wipe them out. You can't place a, a tile that completely destroys a settlement, but if they are wiping out most of them, then it's bad enough. So you don't want the opponent to destroy your settlements too early, but you also do not want settlements in such, that are placed in such a way that you cannot affect them later, because starting a new settlement every time simply takes turns, takes time, takes resources. Any of the opponent has a more efficient way of creating settlements, um, restructuring them, expanding them somewhere else, place a temple, place a tower, restructure them, etc, etc. So, impervious positions seem to be obvious uh, choices at the beginning. I would say they're second best. They're, be they're better than getting your huts constantly destroyed but they're worse than finding that fine-tuning between areas that are safe enough um, that the opponent doesn't constantly destroy them and uh, still areas that you can reconfigure later by adding tiles, destroy some of your huts and continue like that. And then there are so many other subtleties that come out so during play, ways of configuring your settlements in such a way that you have um, hexes of the same type, terrains of the same time adjacent to them so you can expand fast. Uh, but again, at the same time, if you were doing it, then you're spending all of your huts and you put yourself in danger of remaining without uh, components. Uh, not very likely, but there's always the chance of being excessively wasteful. Uh, ways that you move things around to create the three levels so you place a tower that is not immediately the most important thing to do but it does protect again it does protect um part of your settlement because it cannot be built upon uh many different subtleties that will come out i could list them for a while but those other subtleties i'll leave them to you to 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 figure out what I can tell you is that yes, it's a game that I they learned about uh, looking for beautiful games, and I really enjoy the aesthetics of the game. But game-wise, this is also a game that is a little gem, not the little, the big, that, that little of a gem. It's a mid-size or considerable size even. It's fun. It's subtle. Um, with the wrong players, it will uh, cause analysis paralysis. But this is a risk that you have in many deep, complex games. In truth, uh, the board may be configured in such a way that when the player draws a new tile, there are only a couple of places where the tile can possibly be placed that would make sense. Um, so that may keep the analysis paralysis at bay, but I already know there are certain types that will not be discouraged by that and will still take way too long to uh, choose their next move. But other than that, play with the right types that are not AP types. So this is a game that is an absolute gem, an absolute joy to play. A little known game or definitely overlooked and definitely not a game that I think has received its due from the gaming community. I hope that my video will bring more attention to Taluva because it is a really really cool game. Fun, interesting, subtle, deep without being over complicated. Plays in about an hour, a little more, a little, more a little less, so definitely manageable. Beautiful, fun, not hard to learn deep and subtle. I don't know what else you want from a game, but if those are the things you're looking for uh, from a game, then Taluva. Taluva is a good choice.